Hi everyone, Jolene here from Bookworm Adventure Girl. Welcome to the 30th episode of Mondays with Margaret. In today's Mondays with Margaret, we will be talking about a non-fiction book about Canadian literature called Strange Things, The Malevolent North in Canadian Literature. Strange Things was originally published in 1995, and the book is divided into four sections, which were originally lectures given at Oxford University in 1991. And in the introduction, Atwood talks about her trepidation of giving these lectures and not feeling like she would have um, anything to say that the audience wouldn't already know about English literature. So she uses what she calls an ace of her sleeve, which is Canadian literature in English. And specifically, in this case, um, Canadian literature that deals with the Canadian North. So we've already seen this in survival and maybe even in second words um, that Margaret Atwood defends um, that Canadian literature not only exists, but has legitimacy and specific themes that give it a Canadian identity. So she says this on page two of the introduction. Although a few individual and stalwart Canadian writers have managed to thrash their way eastwards across the Atlantic, one might mention, for instance, Michael and Dante, Robertson Davies, Mordecai Rickler, and Alice Munro. Canadian literature as a whole tends to be, to the English literary mind, what Canadian geography itself used to be, an unexplored and uninteresting wasteland, punctuated by a few rocks, bogs, and stumps. Note that I do not speak of the Scots, Welsh, or Irish, nor of the ordinary reader. However, for a certain kind of literary English person, Canada, lacking the exoticism of Africa, the strange fauna of Australia, or the romance of India, still tends to occupy the bottom rung on the status ladder of ex-British colonies. So in these lectures, she's not defending um, Canlet's existence, but she's talking about specific motifs or patterns that exist in Canadian literature that are specific to the Canadian North. So the title of this book itself um, comes from a poem by Robert Service about the Canadian North. And um, the first lecture is called Concerning Franklin and His Gallant Crew. And Atwood has written about Franklin before. Um, you might remember this in one of the short stories in Wilderness Tips um, called The Age of Lead, where Sir John Franklin and 135 men set out to explore the Northwest Passage um, in 1845. And the expedition was last sighted in July of 1845. And there are stories of how the ships got caught in the ice and the men starved to death and that some turn to cannibalism to try and survive. So some bodies had been found over time and evidence that the men were you know, not in their right minds uh, near the end. And it wasn't until the 1980s when they exhumed the bodies of three of the men and found that they had died of lead poisoning um, from eating food from the tin cans that they had. So this explained the disorientation that the men would have had um, in their final days. So Atwood gives the example of an English ballad called Lord Franklin, or it's also called Lady Franklin's Lament, or the Franklin Expedition. Um, there's several versions that are also sung in Canada. And using Robert Service poems and the death of Tom Thompson, who is one of the group of seven, um, these are given as examples of how popular lore and popular literature established early that the North was uncanny, awe-inspiring in an almost religious way, hostile to white men, but alluring, <laughs> that it would lead you on and do you in, um, that it would drive you crazy, and finally would claim you for its own. And this is from page 22. So other examples are Terror and Erebus by Gwendolyn McEwen. And Terra and Erebus were the names of the two ships used in the Franklin Expedition. Um, and this contains a lot of metaphors. Uh, one of the main ideas being that thinking about the North has to be done in a specific uh, way. 
And then there's Al Purdy's poem called The Northwest Passage that was written in 1967. And then she brings up Graham Gibson's novel Perpetual Motion, uh, which was written in 1982. And it's about the conflict between nature and technology. And Mordecai Rickler's novel Solomon Gursky was here um, from 1989. Atwood says that the novel delivers an outrageous burlesque of the Franklin story, and that's on page 36. So Atwood notes that other novelists have also written about Franklin, uh, like Ruby Weave, and she ends by sharing the song, The Northwest Passage, which was written by Stan Rogers. So the next lecture is called The Grey Owl Syndrome. And in this lecture, Atwood talks about the desire of some non-natives turning themselves into natives. Um, so one person was an Englishman named Archibald Blaney, who became Grey Owl. And there was also Black Wolf, and both of them were conservationists and naturalists. And Atwood talks about appropriation, uh, which he says was a big debate at the time. And I would say that this debate is ongoing and has maybe found some new steam in recent years. Um, <clears throat> Ernest Thompson Seton was born in England in 1860. So his family moved to Canada when he was six. And in the books that he was influenced by, and then later on in the books that he wrote, the Indians were the good guys and came out above white people because they had the skills to hunt and to survive. So he became the founder um, of the Woodcraft Indians and the movement and philosophy was then taken by Baden Powell who started the Boy Scouts. So this movement was taking place at the same time that residential schools were kidnapping children, you know, to take the Indian out of the child in horrible and abusive ways. Um, and some of you may have seen the news recently where 215 children were found buried as, at a residential school in Kamloops, BC. So these issues and topics are still very relevant. Um, the difference between Seton and Grey Owl is that Seton knew that he was not really Black Wolf, um, whereas Grey Owl only wanted one identity and that was his identity as an Indian. So stories of Grey Owl show up in Alice Munro's story, The Dance of the Happy Shades, which was written in 1968, and in Robert Croach's novel Gone Indian in 1973, and Gwendolyn McEwen um, has a poem that was written for Grey Owl called Grey Owl's Poem, um, and this is in her last book um, called Afterworlds. The third lecture is called Eyes of Blood, Heart of Ice, The Wendigo. Um, the Wendigo is a motif that Atwood talks about either in second words or survival as well. Um, Atwood begins the lecture by acknowledging the obscurity of the Wendigo. Um, is it a figure, a verb, or a process? And I'd like to read um, a poem and description of the Wendigo from this lecture and it begins on page 80. And the poem is called The Wendigo. It's from Ogden Nash, and the poem was written in 1936. The Wendigo, the Wendigo, its eyes are ice and indigo. Its blood is rank and yellowish. Its voice is hoarse and bellowish. Its tentacles are slithery and scummy, slimy, leathery. Its lips are hungry, blubbery, and smacky, suck, rubbery. The Wendigo, the Wendigo, I saw it just a friend ago. Last night it lurked in Canada, tonight on your veranda. As you are lolling hammock-wise, it contemplates you stomach-wise. You loll, it contemplates, it lollops, the rest is merely gulps and gollops. As you may just have gathered, the Wendigo is a cannibal. But that and its location is about all Ogden Nash got right. It's the Wendigo's heart, not its eyes, that's made of ice. The eyes themselves are supposed to roll in blood, and it has claws rather than tentacles. Although its voice bellows, it also whistles. Its lips are not blubbery, but blackened and eaten away as if by decay, small animals, or frostbite. Nash, being American, lived far enough away from the North so that he could reduce the Wendigo to an amusing poem 
but for those who believe in it, the Wendigo is far from being a laughing matter. In their indigenous versions, Wendigo legends and stories are confined to the eastern woodlands and largely to Algonquian speaking peoples, such as the Woodland Cree and the Ojibwe. The concept has many name variations, including Weedigo, Wataco, Windigo, and 34 others, all beginning with W and having three syllables, as well as a number of forms beginning with different letters. All of these and much else have been catalogued by, sorry, have been catalogued by that compulsive collector John Robert Colombo in his anthology of sightings, tales, and stories called Windigo 5. But all agree that the Wendigo is, among other things, a giant spirit creature with a heart and sometimes an entire body of ice and prodigious strength and that it can travel as fast as the wind. In some stories it has feet of fire, in others it makes tracks like giant snowshoes. It has no gender, although an individual Wendigo may once have been a man or a woman. It eats moss and frogs and mushrooms, but more particularly human beings, in fact. Its prevailing characteristics seem to be its ravenous hunger for human flesh. For those of you who have been following this series from the beginning, you might remember speeches for Frankenstein. It was early on. And I would make some comparisons here, ensuring us that Frankenstein's monster um, may have been a monster, but he was not a Wendigo. And the two things that are feared about the Wendigo is being eaten by one or becoming one. So Atwood says that Wendigo narratives can be similar to ghost stories. Um, they can also be stories where the Wendigo has a message for the protagonist and they can also reveal, you know, something of the protagonist's psyche. And then in the final lecture, which is called Linoleum Caves, the title is inspired from a line in Alice Munro's Lives of Girls and Women, which is a novel I loved. And this lecture focuses on how women writers write about the North. Um, women are an important part of Canadian literature, although when it comes to Northern mythology, it's almost without women. So there are no women explorers, um, there are wives of explorers, there are no grey owl equivalents uh, females, um, and there's no females who went exploring in the north and fighting the elements um, or went mad. So Howard talks about Pauline Johnson on page 113 and her piece called The Indian Girl in Modern Fiction, which came out um, in the Globe and Mail in 1892. And in this article, she tears a strip off a number of white authors for dishing up again and again the same kind of Indian maiden in their books. A poor, doomed creature who passionately loves the white hero, but is not loved in return, who is so much wrapped up in him that she is treacherous to her own people, tells falsehoods to her father and the other chiefs of the tribe, and generally makes herself detestable and dishonorable. Who is dog-like, fawn-like, deer-footed, fire-eyed, crouching, submissive. All these are adjectives she quotes from real books and who usually ends her life by suicide because of the perfidy of her white lover. So Abbott talks about two waves of women on page 117 and she describes them like this. Women of the 19th century who were either early settlers themselves or contemporaneous with them and the second wave women of the 20th century who followed these first women and either built upon, wrote about, or contrasted their own lives with those of their predecessors. There is one huge difference between first and second waves. The women of the first wave were not in the North Woods of their own volition. They were there because circumstances and fate, namely their husbands, had dragged them there. None of these women marched off into the woods alone, whereas, as we will see, those of the second wave did. Her examples of women in the first wave are Anna Jameson, who wrote a travel book, Susanna Moody, who we have talked about several times um, in this series, and we already know that she wrote um, to warn anyone who was considering immigrating to the north of Canada. Um, and she talks more about the hardships and the catastrophes that she's endured and experienced. 
Um, and then there's Catherine Parr Trail, who wrote a book called The Canadian Settler's Guide, um, which included recipes, furnishings, and tips for making the best of the situation. So Atwood calls this pattern the tourist, the coper, and the dismayed. And then the second wave writers were women like Margaret Lawrence. Um, and we begin to see in the middle of the 20th century women protagonists um, going off into the woods on their own um, rather than following their husbands. And in some cases, it was actually to escape their husbands. Um, so examples that Atwood gives is Ethel Wilson's novel um, Swamp Angel, in which Maggie Vardo is escaping her husband Edward. And she talks about Marion Engel's book called Bear, which is still on my Canadian literature TBR. Um, the protagonist, Lou, is sent to an isolated place for work to see if it is suitable um, for an institute that they want to have there, and there is a bear. And the bear is friendly, and she befriends the bear, and yes, there's a lot more to that story. So, um, But what Atwood notices in these examples is that she gives um, these women are the protagonists and the wilderness becomes neutral. Um, it is not seen as female as it is with male writers. And there tends to be themes of like renewal and rebirth. And then finally Atwood shares a Wen Wendigo story in which the Wendigo is female in Anne Tracy's novel Winter Hunger, which was published in 1990. And the description of this story is so intense, I might have to check it out. Um, and then Atwood finishes this lecture and the lecture series by talking about how her work has been influenced by these patterns. And I've already mentioned some of them, um, but I did mention surface, uh, sorry, I didn't mention surfacing, which um, she calls her woman in the woods novel. And the one I didn't remember, um, but will now go back and read is Wilderness Tips, um, the short story itself, not the entire collection. Um, and that's where a man longs to be an Indian like gray owl. And then she finishes up talking about the northern, um, the north of Canada and how it's not infinite and we've taken it for granted. And so her love of nature and um, comes out in that as well. This was a really interesting book and I loved learning um, even more about Atwood's thought process when it comes to these Canadian patterns in literature. And now that we've read so much of her work, it's been fun, you know, finding it in the works that we've, that we've read. So her wit is evident throughout the book. Um, even the acknowledgements are worth reading for entertainment. Um, and another humorous example is when she is um, introducing the Franklin Expedition. Atwood says that um, Canadians are fond of a good disaster. Um, and she says, especially if it has, you know, ice, water, or snow in it. And then she says, you know, you thought the national flag was a maple leaf, didn't you? And she goes, look harder. It's where someone got axed in the snow. <laughs> and that's on page 14. And so I don't think I will ever be able to see the Canadian flag the same again. Um, so that is Strange Things, the Malevolent North in Canadian literature. Um, let me know if you've read Strange Things or if you are interested in any of the patterns that Atwood um, talks about. I'd be happy to hear your thoughts on any of it. I look forward to chatting with you in the comments. Thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and don't forget to make every day an adventure.